So um, one of the things that um, everything ways that reason we're here is uh, because of Alaska Quarterly Review, 40 years, uh, a, a lot of really great literary magazines have come and gone in that time. And Ron has still kept his, uh, in their league, still kept his going. So um, one of the things I've, I've always admired about that magazine is that when you're a young writer, you, you get these, well, now you go online and, and you try to find out what magazines you might submit to. And all the magazines say we're looking for young writers. If one has gone through that process, it seems that when you start sending your work out, uh, that's a myth. It is not a myth at Alaska Quarterly Review. I, I don't know if anybody's kept it out of, of stories Ron has published by by writers' uh, first poems, but it's it's uh, it, the, that's what that magazine's about. Yeah. So here's a story I published there called Brisket. Their pale, plump skins scorched almost to burning. The Thuringers invited a plaster of brown mustard. The stack for Strami was decked out in Zooty 1950 colors, flesh pink, meat, and a carpus, black pepper. There was corned beef, a waiting horse radish, kosher franks, kraut, dangly salamis, tukas, house hickory smoked turkeys, trout, sable fish, and two kinds of dishes, then kasha and golden scores of potato, slaw, paprika dusted, potato salad, fried onions and schmaltz, green tomatoes, Kaiser rolls, baguettes, pumpernickel. Been walking around all day in the cold. It all looked good. But finally, when my turn in line arrived, I decided to invest my last few dollars, garlic kiss, brisket, I'm right. Young man, I'm going to make you a sandwich, murmured the old ball server wearing a stained white apron. He said it conspiratorially, his lips hardly moving, drawing me toward him in order to hear as if it were something he'd rather the owners of the establishment not get wind of, a secret between the two of us, not for the ears of the others behind me in line. Lance looked in my eyes and held him as if he'd taken a personal interest in me which was more than I could say for the secretaries and interviewers and the personnel offices where I'd spent the last six weeks filling out applications for jobs until my money ran out. And I moved from friend to friend, crashing from apartment to apartment, sleeping on sofas and floors as if I'd, as if I'd never grow up if I stayed poor. His face cross hatched in lines was set and the comically, tragically expression he practiced until it had become his permanent physiognomy. He must have been making sandwiches for a long time. Must have seen a lot of hungry faces staring back at him from the other side of the bulletproof glass partition. Maybe he'd learned to read faces at a glance, to read in mind that a desperation I'd never felt before was setting in that I needed a helping hand, that I'd caught enough of a glimpse of what it meant to be down, homeless, jobless, walking the streets, hungry to last a lifetime. Or maybe to get through the day, he allowed himself now and then to take a liking to a face of a perfect stranger, a face that perhaps reminded him of himself when he was young or of someone in his past, the way that riding the subway and watching all the people with jobs filing on I'd sometimes see a woman who would remind me of an old girlfriend in another city, a city I should have stayed in, a girlfriend I should have stayed with. That same girlfriend who once told me, you've got a working class face. Maybe he thought so too. See, he said, surgically trimming off the fat with the tip of his carving knife and then scraping the trimmings across the cutting board counter, leaving a trail of grease. That's when I noticed the numbers tattooed on his wrist. I'd seen the famous, the, the faded marks of the death camps on the wrists of tailors in that neighborhood before. But those tattooed numbers still shocked me into a sense of dislocation. The brutal reality of history crowded out the mundane present. 
I wondered what he thought when he looked at his wrist every day. What horrible memories did he overcome each day? When I saw those numbers, I felt ashamed. Here I was spending my last few bucks, big deal. I would survive. How about some nice scraps for your dog, he asked, gesturing with his knife to the pile of trimmings that he'd been accumulating for mine and other sandwiches. Attached to the fat were hearty looking ribbons of brisket. There was at least another meal there. I said, okay, he said, still with that confidential tone, as if something preferential were going on between us. Working in a practice, methodical sequence he wrapped the trimmings in wax paper and the wax paper in a sheet of brown butcher paper which he expertly folded into a neat tight easily concealed packet before taping it and handing it toward me only two dollars two dollars for your dog i thought he'd been offering to give them away <laughs> suddenly i feel total fool all at once it struck me that whatever Never had made naive enough to think the scraps might be free was the same impulse that had landed me in my current situation. Out of work, living from friend to friend, missing a woman in a, another city, a woman who had already given up on me. I don't have a dog, I told him. You just said you had one. I, I used to have one. You forgot you don't have a dog anymore? You couldn't get over that someone could make such a mistake. I, I had a dog, but he died. I still say yes, I'm force of habit. I'm sorry to hear about your dog. Thanks, I said, you know her name, Yappy. Happy Yappy, I used to call him. He sure would have liked those scraps. Maybe you have a cat. No cat, I said. You sure now? Positive. Want the garlicky pickle with that? How much, I asked. I'd learned my lesson. Comes with the sandwich. <laughs> That's great. I didn't ruin That's anybody's great. meal. <laughs> oh, so wonderful. <laughs> Stuart, we're having a tad difficulty seeing you, but we can hear you just fine. You've got a funny okay. um, little thing happening with the pixels, but. Um, I, your voice came through loud and clear, and it was pretty great. Thank you. The sound Must is be the weather in Miami. In Miami. <laughs> um, when, um, when, when was that in AQR, Stuart? How, how long ago did you write that brisket? I'm trying to remember. Um, Ron, any idea? I might know. No. I, I don't I, I can't remember. I, I mean a while back. Yeah. It, yeah. A while back. it was uh cited in uh, Best American. So yeah, that, that's I don't remember the year of him. I mean maybe six years, seven years ago. I don't know. Yeah. That it, 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 like all of your work, it ho it holds up so beautifully. It's it there's a time timeless quality and an, and an of the moment quality. And I still feel that sort of heart clutch when he realizes he is to pay for what he thought was free. <laughs> it's just one of those moments. <laughs> and it's lovely to hear you read it. Um, I thought I've, I have never heard you read it before. I've read it on the page, of course. Um, but wow, thank you for that. I, I always feel guilty when something that actually happened. <laughs> I mean, you can't really take any credit for it, right? I just... Well, you can't take credit because you, you recognized it, that it was gold. Yeah, you recognized so. it. And you were listening, you know, you, you, were, open, you were open for business. You heard it. It was, it was a good opportunity to write about food. <laughs> oh. The Chicago Lee Young Lee was a good friend of mine. Well, was a good oh. friend. I haven't seen him in a long time. I just always admired in his poetry how he'd have these enormously lyrical lists of, of uh, different kinds of Chinese dishes. And 
Uh, so I, I, I probably just you kind know, of pinched that notion from him and stuck it in the brisket there. Right? Where was where was the place you had the brisket? I'm from Chicago. I think you know. Just off, just off how this was in New York, and it was oh, this is New York. Just off, just off Houston, yeah. Just off Houston. Down in the Lower East Side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope I've been there too. I would like to think I've been there. Well, it, I'm going to say I've been there. Like celery soda. Mm. Mm. Lovely. But, but you know, I, I hope that was. I I mean, I hope it. I it was a kind of an odd story to write about because you've got this hideous, um, the 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 Holocaust enters the story with the tattoo. And yet the story is now in, in an America where you can joke about things like the price of a pick or right. what's going on when you're standing in line. And that, that kind of discordant note in the story um, scared me a little bit. Um, but um, what, what I'm trying to head for here is that whole notion of comedy because um, You've got that. I mean, one of the stories I always teach of yours is it has a, a guy named um, God. What's his name? Big, big, big guy. guy. Big guy. Yeah. What's the name? What's what's the name I'm of most, the story with big? The most girl part of you. Where they where they crunch ice with their teeth. Yeah. And yeah. but I mean, like a lot of the stories, and um, they're hilarious, really truly funny, but. There's always that kind of discordant uh, note in them at the same time, and I, I just I find that kind of a fascinating combination. I I do too. And when the the and, and when the, the, the there's the notice of of take the chief's notice of the number um, on the wrist. It, you do that counter counterintuitive thing of because you kind of you know here's this dark core <laughs> you know and and because you glance off of it you're not the story is not about that but you just glance off of it 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 underscores the impact um in a really kind of magical way um which is another writer seeing that done well. It's, it's very impressive. It, it really works. And there's a lesson there. There's something to learn uh, in, in the way you do that. Yeah. Well, I, I, were you going to say what the lesson was? Oh, that, that Be just what I said, that, that, that instead of having the big thing, the big dark thing, you know, in the story and and just looking at it head on and um, uh, that if you just glance off of it it's just a moment it ends up being stronger it, it it's contrary it, to what you expect I, I i couldn't agree more i we were talking a little bit before the um we started and and heather asked about music and one of the things that's always impressed me about music is the whole notion of counterpoint Oh, okay. And and uh, so you know one of the great counterpoints, for instance, that I think we both work out, work with, is the counterpoint between the lyrical and the narrative. But mm -hmm. but another one is that counterpoint between the, the comic and something darker. And that, I mean that just and and you don't kind of have to uh, the the reader fills in what that counterpoint is doing. The writer just makes the counterpoint. And, and yes. the reader puts those two together and yes. kind of participates in, in the story that way. So I think very much participates in that way. And it, it is a, 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 something I'm always drawn to when I'm working and you know, when I'm writing and when I'm reading. Um, so that's um, it's just something I prize when I come across it done exactly right as it is here. Thank you again. And are you going to, are you going to read um, one more? I can, but you want to jump in? Oh, I, I'd I'd love to uh, I'd love to hear Pet Milk. 
<laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> More about food. <laughs> Today I've been drinking instant coffee and pet milk. It's not, it's not that I enjoy the taste, especially when I like the way pet milk swirls in coffee. Actually, my favorite thing about pet milk is what the can opener does to the top of the can. The can is unmistakable, compact, seamless looking. It's very shaped, suggesting that it could condensed milk without any trouble. The can opener opens, bites in neatly. The thick liquid spills from the triangular gouge with a different look and viscosity than milk. Pet milk isn't real milk. The color's off the start. There's almost something of the past about it, like old ivory. My grandmother I understand it in her. When friends dropped over and sat around the kitchen table, my grandma would ask, you take cream and sugar? Pet milk was the cream. It was a yellow plastic radio kitchen table, usually tuned to the polka station. Although sometimes, although sometimes she'd miss it by a half notch and get the Greek station instead, or the Spanish or the Ukrainian. In Chicago, where we lived, all the incompatible states of Europe were pressed down the other at the static key right under the dial. She didn't seem to notice as long as she wasn't hearing English. The radio, turned low, played constantly. Its top was warped and turning amber on the side where the tubes were. I remember the sound of it on winter afternoons after school as I sat by her table watching the pet mill swirl and cloud and the steaming coffee and noticing outside her window the sky doing the same thing above the railroad yard across the street. And I remember much later seeing the same swirling sky in tiny liqueur glasses containing a drink called a King Alphonse, the crumb of cocoa rising like smoke and ripped explosions, looming in kaleidoscopic clouds through a layer of heavy cream. This was in the Pilsen, a little Czech restaurant, where my girlfriend Kate and I would sometimes go in the evening. It was the first year out of college for both of us, and we'd astonished ourselves by finding real jobs no more waitressing or pumping gas the way we'd done in school. I was investigating credit cards at a bank and she was doing something slightly above the rank of typist for Hornblower and Weeks, the investment firm. My bank showed training fills which emphasized the importance of suitable dress, good grooming and personal neatness, neatness even for employees like me who work at the switchboard in the basement. Her firm issued directives on appropriate attire, skirts for instance, should cover the knees. She had lovely knees. Kate and I would sometimes meet after work at the Pilsen, dressed in our proper business clothes and still feeling both a little self-conscious and glamorous as if we were imposters wearing disguises. We'd sit small round oak tables and we'd sit in a corner under a painting called the Street Musicians of Prague, trade future plans as if they were escape routes she talked of going to grad school in Europe. I wanted to apply to the Peace Corps. Our plans for the future made us laugh and feel close, but those same, same plans somehow made everything more temporary between us seem impossible. It was the first time I ever had the feeling of missing someone. So, waiters at the person wore short black jackets with long white aprons. They were old men from the old country. We went there often enough to have our own special waiter, Rudy, a name he pronounced with a rolled R. Rudy Bondard Trout seasoned our salads. And at the end of the meal, he'd bring a bottle of creme de coco from the bar along with two little glasses and a small pitcher of heavy cream and make us each a King Alphonse right at our table. We'd watch as he'd fill the glasses halfway up with a syrupy brown liqueur and carefully attempt to float a layer of cream on top if he failed to float the cream, we'd get that one free. Who was King Alphonse anyway, Rudy? I sometimes asked him to break his concentration. And if that didn't work, I nudged the table with my foot so the glass would jiggle imperceptibly just as he was floating the cream. We'd usually get one on the house. Rudy knew what I was doing. In fact, serving the King Alphonse had been his idea. And he'd also suggested the trick of tearing the table. I think it pleased him. We seemed concerned about the way I'd stare 
piece of the liqueur glass watching the patterns. It's not a microscope. Drink. We like this and we did that. It felt good to be there and to be able to pay for it. Kate and I met at the Pilsen for supper. It was May and unseasonably hot. I'd opened my tie. Even before looking at the dinner menu, we ordered a bottle of mums and a dozen oysters of pizza. Rudy made a sly remark when he brought the oysters on platters of ice. They were freshly opened and smelled of the sea. I'd heard people joke about oysters being aphrodisiac, but never considered it anything but a myth. The kind of idea they still had in the old country. We squeezed on lemon, added dabs of horseradish, slid the oysters into our mouths, and then rinsed the shells with champagne, drank the salty juice. It's a beautiful at the next. And they stared at us with the repugnance that public oyster eaters in the Midwest often encounter. We laughed and grandly sipped it all down. I was already had to see from drinking too fast and started to feel truly the euphoric ache of energy. To the Peace Corps, I said. To Europe, to the Peace Corps, uh, Kate said, raising a brimming oyster shell to me. To Europe, I replied, and we clumped shells. She touched her wine glass to mine and whispered, happy birthday, and then suddenly leaned across the table and kissed me. When she sat down, she was flushed. I caught the reflection of her face in the glass covered the street musicians of Prague above the table. I'd always loved seeing her in mirrors and windows. The reflections of her beauty startled me. I told her that once, and she seemed to fend off the compliment, saying, that's because you learn what they look for. So it was a secret I'd stumped upon. But this time, seeing her reflection hovering ghost-like upon an imaginary prog, <clears throat> it was like seeing a future from which she'd vanished. I knew I'd never meet anyone more beautiful than me. We killed the champagne and sat twining fingers across the table. I was sweating. I could feel the warmth of her through the skirt under the table, and I touched her leg. We still hadn't ordered dinner. I left money on the table, and we stirred each other out a little unsteadily. Rudy will understand, I said. The street was blindingly bright. I read a sun angle just above the rims of the tallest buildings. I took my suit coat off and flipped it over my shoulder. We stopped in the doorway of a shoe store to kiss. Let's go somewhere, she said. My roommate, roommate would already be home at my place, which was closer. Kate lived up north in Evanston. Seemed a long way away. We cut down a side street past the fire station in a to a small park, but the gate was locked. I pressed close to her against the tall iron fence. You could smell the lilacs from the bush just inside the fence. When I jumped for an overhanging branch, my shirt sleeve hooked on a fence spike and tore, and pedals rained down on us as the sprig sprang from my hand. We walked to the subway. Evening rush was winding down. We must have caught the last express heading toward Evanston. Once the train climbed from the tunnel into the to the elevated tracks, we wouldn't stop until the end of the line on Howard. There weren't any seats together, so we stood swaying at the front of the car beside the empty conductor's compartment. We wedged inside, and I clicked the door shut. The train rocked and jounced, clattering north. We were kissed, trying to catch the rhythm of the ride with our bodies. The sun bronzed the winds on our side of the train. I lifted her skirt above her knees. I did it so the sun shone off her thighs. <clears throat> bunched it around her waist. She would stop kissing. She was moving her hips to finish the each jolt of the train. We were speeding past smart scorched brick walls. Gray windows, back porches outlined in sun, roofs, treetops, the landscape of the yell I'd memorized from subway windows over a lifetime of rides. Psychiatrist foot sign at Fullerton, the bright pennants of Wrigley Field, Edison, ancient hotels with transient welcome signs on their flaking back walls, peeling and graffiti smudged billboards. Old cemetery just before Wilson Avenue. Even when looking, I knew almost exactly where we were. Within the compartment, the sound of our quick breathing was louder than the clatter, clatter of tracks. I was trying to slow down to make it all last. And when she covered my mouth with her hand, I turned my face to the window and looked out. The train was breaking a little from express speed as it did each time it passed the local station. I could see blurred faces on the long wooden platform watching us pass businessmen 
glancing up from folded newspapers, women clutching purses and champing. I could see the expression on each face momentarily arrested as we flashed by. A high school kid in shirt sleeves, maybe 16, with books tucked <clears throat> under one arm and a cigarette in his mouth caught sight of us. And then the instant before he disappeared, he grinned and started to wave. And then he was gone. And I turned from the window back to Kate, forgetting everything. Passing stations, the glowing light sky, even a sense of missing her. But that arrested wave stayed with me. It was as if I were standing on that platform with my school books in a smoke. And one of those endlessly accumulated afternoons after school, when I stood almost outside of time, simply waiting for a train. <clears throat> and I thought how much I'd have loved seeing someone like us streaming by.